Now, NFV is a, is a spectrum. It's a journey. We can no longer compete using old school IP infrastructure. We need software on standard hardware. There is no such thing as peak hour. You know, the traffic peaks and stays peaked. The scale is just almost out of control. You couldn't solve the scale problem by making bigger boxes. You had to really re-architect the network. If you stand still, you're done. Process, people, tools. All of those will have to be rethought, rewired. Fundamentally, networking is turning to a software industry. We live in historic times, driven by innovation. But is technology providing real value? And how do we translate that value into our lives, our companies, our network? How do we stay connected without draining vital resources? Are we moving towards efficiency and sustainability? Or are we weakening the network? A connected world is what we strive for. It changes the world we live in every day, every minute, and sometimes every second. It's what makes our lives better. It's the network of the future. Twenty twelve, Darmstadt, Germany. SDN and OpenFlow World Congress is underway. For the first time, many in the telecom world will hear the term NFV, Network Functions Virtualization, a new path for telecom networks to keep up with the insatiable demand for bandwidth. Seven of the world's top network operators have released a white paper advocating for a revolutionary way of building out and running networks at a fraction of the cost at a blistering speed to market with astonishing scalability. That was a sea change in the whole world of telecom in the, in the mobile side. Folks saw the groundswell of operators who were now behind this concept. This was multiple large service providers saying, we can no longer compete and drive our businesses using old school IP infrastructure. We need software on standard hardware in order to advance our strategies and advance our infrastructure. So if there was a shot heard around the world in the service provider space, it was in October 2012 when the readout of that paper happened. Traditional theory says each function in a network is best performed by robust, purpose-built hardware. One machine for each instance and function. Virtualization replaces the single machine with a virtual device that is hosted on a linked group of machines. This is NFV, and it's the foundation of a virtual network. This virtualized device can be more flexible in its functionality, as well as more cost-efficient. But perhaps more importantly, a virtual device can be driven by software in ways that a dedicated piece of hardware never could. This addition of software control allows for a software-defined network, or SDN. NFV and SDN are so closely linked, they are often confused. But together, they lay the groundwork for a virtualized network. They are the catalyst for the transition from hardware-based networks to more software-driven ones. NFV, SDN, cloud, all these things are essentially just automation tools. And so what we're finding is building enormous things that change very rapidly and keeping them up and running and synchronized is becoming impossible when there are manual procedures and error-prone humans in the loop. One thing I think that really changed in the mobile networking space is mobile networks were built as access networks to do simple things like check email on your BlackBerry and stuff like that. And as, um, as we got the full internet experience in mobile and people started using rich media over, over mobile networks so on, all of a sudden the economics of the legacy network just didn't work anymore. And that became a very significant trigger point because you couldn't solve the scale problem by making bigger boxes. You had to really re-architect the network. What we used to call in the legacy world as a peak hour, uh, there is no such thing as peak hour. You know, the traffic peaks and stays peaked. Or you can call them a series of peaks, right, throughout the 24-hour cycle. If you look at the network operator point of view, especially the telecom service providers, their traffic growth is causing them to buy more and more equipment at a rate greater than the revenue increase they're getting from the increased traffic. So they have to have a new model. For the enterprises and the data center operators in particular, the scale is just almost out of control and they again can't afford a continued hardware intensive model for networking. So operators have to think hard about how they're going to compete in the internet economy, an economy with a serious hurdle. 
a growing number of over-the-top companies. These companies deliver services directly to the end customer, services that were traditionally provided by carriers. The most dominant example is video, which consumes an overwhelming share of all internet traffic. Once you have a pipe, a very high-speed data pipe, enabled in many cases by SDN and NFV, um, to the home, the OTTs will come in because with that, with that extended bandwidth, I can now run a lot more services than I could historically possible. There's always this concern about the OTT coming in to eat their lunches, and that's why, you know, the excuse is, that's why I have SDN and NFV. I'm here to you know, use SDN and NFV to add new services, be more agile, be more flexible. If you're a dyed-in-the-wool kind of incumbent vendor, the challenge is going to be that what used to be a strength in your business model may be a liability now. You know, to have locked up black box models that have three year change cycles before there's any innovation introduced in the industry. However, now in this new world with systems decoupling, the pace of change is just radically faster. We're talking about pace of change in, in months as opposed to years. Traditionally, we've taken this approach, network service providers, large scale, of a very bottoms up where we would build reliability and scale in the hardware. And we'd work it all the way up to the service that would be running on top of that. And that approach has worked very well for many decades. But where we've seen tremendous advances and scaling is over in the web scale companies and what they've been able to do. And they've taken this sort of top-down approach. So where they build scale, resiliency, and performance, is in the software layers that are sitting on top of commoditized hardware. So that's really the pivot we're looking at making when we shift to software. I think hardware suppliers who try to preserve the ability to, to uh, sell their legacy platforms are ultimately not going to succeed because they're gonna fall behind the innovation curve. And it's not to say everyone needs to go full bore on virtualization right now, right? You think about even those who are going really fast, they're not virtualizing everything, right? They're spelling out a strategy for how they get there over a certain amount of time. Because your competitors are virtualizing, if you're not and you're very hardware-centric, hardware is expensive to procure. It's also expensive to roll out and operate. So I would expect that those operators that are not interested or investing into virtualization technologies are likely going to find themselves consuming technologies from their, uh, some of their competitors as a way to provide services to their regional customers. It's safe to say this is no longer hype. Dedicated hardware is out. Virtualization is in. But on the road to NFE, network operators are facing a lot of hurdles in order to make NFE a fully-fledged reality. So one of the challenges of bringing new technologies to the market is having it integrated with the existing legacy equipment. I've got in the telco space my OSS and BSS and my management systems. How do I take advantage of this without disrupting that stuff, without throwing it out? In my infrastructure, I have, I have routers, I have switches. They speak legacy protocols. How do I add this gradually? So it's tempting to say, start from scratch, throw everything away, build all fresh greenfield, and certainly in a POC environment, that's, that's a reasonable way to approach it. You're, you're really trialing and understanding what, what is the technology capable of. The reality is networks are large, they exist, and all of these solutions need to interoperate with the existing legacy uh, infrastructure. To actually make sure everything works, you have to have a lab that says, okay, this guy works with this guy, this all actually works together like it's supposed to, to, to meet that promise. Um, and I think that's particularly important in the telco space because let's let's just be honest you can't take base station from vendor a and magically have it work with a base station controller from vendor b right the interoperability just despite the interfaces hasn't been there the movement for NFV is to move you to commodity hardware, right? Basically extract the proprietary value that you've been getting. And so by definition, NFV takes off, then you will lose you know, product revenue with regard to the integrated product. That's for certain. Although there is a lot of commoditization going on, there's still a lot of differentiation within that commoditization. Functions will have uh, different performance characteristics from one supplier versus another. And so that's the way they can differentiate is their particular solution actually performs better or has different capabilities or their own sort of secret sauce, if you will. We may see a shift in where the intelligence sits from the hardware to the software. But if you look at the PC revolution, it's not like that server sales stopped. And to the contrary, right, there was more and more hardware sold. 
uh, as basically you are able to deliver more value with this hardware to the customers. So I'm very bullish on, on networking hardware vendors uh, just as much on software vendors. I think the, the main effect of this at the end of the day will be that customers get a lot more value uh, you know, from, uh, from, from networking than they did previously. I think the primary barrier to entry is conservative thinking and fear of the unknown. These are very new technologies. Uh, you know, I spoke to the operator of one of the big cloud networks and described a technology to him which could provide, you know, sort of 50% cost savings. And his response to me was, you could provide, you know, 90% cost savings. And if I have to radically change the way I operate my network, I'm not interested. From an IT perspective, People know how to manage the IT infrastructure and they have processes and systems around that. From the network side, they have similar processes and systems around how to manage networks. What we're talking about here is IT and network coming together, and these two approaches are not the same. The hurdles are going to be process, people, tools. All of those will have to be rethought, rewired to really adapt to this new networking model. When every vendor does their discussion of, of what are we doing within NFE, right? They'll have their slide deck, and there'll always be that slide of here's all the organizations we belong to. There are what, some 30 odd standard bodies and open source communities that are working on it. So that's definitely in the long term unsustainable. That's way too many. It points to the idea of how deeply can you be involved with each of those, and, and where do they overlap and where do they contradict and, and how do you coordinate all of those, right? A lot of people salute the flag of open source software, but to really be committed to it means you have to agree that you're not just gonna take it, you're gonna contribute back. Open is actually a, a very interesting phrase, right? And you have to be kind of careful about what open really means because a lot of vendors would come in and say, yes, we are open, which means their APIs can be consumed by any application developer in the world but those APIs are still tied to the vendor's specific implementation. So it's not standards-based, it's not defined in an industry open source consortium. One of the interesting things about open source is, depending on the licensing model, you may be able to make modifications that you keep locally and, and distribute essentially as a proprietary component as part of your solution. That's absolutely the case today, um, and, and I'm sure we'll always see that in the market. One of the concerns as a, as a consumer of that type of solution that you, you should think about is, are you being locked into a particular vendor-specific solution when your goal is to, is to eliminate vendor lock-in and, and build your solutions out of open platforms that are interoperable? One reason that people are sort of, sort of holding back a little bit is to see that it's a little bit chaotic right now in the sense that there are a lot of people participating, contributing, and a lot, lot of multiple variations of the same technology that may exist in the architecture. So it'll all evolve as the dust settles. So some people are waiting for the dust to settle. Particularly with NFE, I think that there's you know, multiple different fears about security coming in, right? The idea of open, right? There's always this idea that if something is open, that security may become a different, you know, a larger issue because you know, there's more people that have access to actually what's going on inside those boxes. There is this fear that if I'm doing more stuff, I'm moving more towards a cloud-based model where I pull more of my applications into one place, one type of architecture. Does that provide a bigger security risk? So security is a really critical part of the NFE story, and security is at, is at every level. In some cases, some of this cloud infrastructure may be exposed directly to users. Uh, and, and in any case, when you have a programmable infrastructure, you want to ensure that you know who's making uh, the changes to the infrastructure and that they've been authorized and authenticated appropriately. In terms of being an afterthought, it still is a bit of an afterthought. If you take 10 different things that you ask a service provider do they care about, it's not going to be number 10 or number 9 or number 8. You know, it has to be, there's enough of an understanding that it has to be more than that, but it's also probably not number 1, 2, or 3, right? Because the service provider is more focused on how do I get this stuff rolled out, how do I make sure it's carrier grade, whatever that means in terms of scale, in terms of reliability? How do I figure out what my mono strategy is? So it's not really top of mind, but it's still seen as important. And so we need to keep pushing that up to make sure that, that it does get the recognition that, that it really needs. The problems are real and will not be solved overnight. But there's a reason why people are so excited and investing so heavily in NFE. The benefits are striking. 
Take security, for example. When you centralize security, the problems of a single point of attack become secondary to the flexibility it provides a network and how that can make your network significantly more secure. In a modern data center, typically a lot of the investment around security is in the perimeter, you know, because you're trying to get a very secure firewall, but you invest very little sort of in, in getting visibility inside your network. Where once an attacker is through the firewall, they can move around and you have very little to stop them. And it turns out that with um, software-defined networking, um, you know, and specifically what we call micro-segmentation, I want to basically create very, very small firewalled areas in my data center, right? So in the extreme, put a firewall around every single server, right? If you try to do this with a physical firewall, it's impossible. You can basically get to an architecture where you say, I'm defining a new application, right? And basically, by default, I have firewalls everywhere. Yeah? No, no server can talk to another server. Instead, I'm allowing certain connections, right? The web tier can talk to the application tier on a certain port. The application tier can talk to the database on a certain port. You know, I have some ports open for backup and monitoring purposes, but that's it. Any other connection in the data center will be blocked, right? It's a, it's a much more modern security architecture, provides a very high degree of protection. You can now actually provide an, an IT organization with super fine-grained visibility about every connection in their data center. You can basically create these very small network segments uh, you know, that basically make your, your data center very resilient against compromises. Even if one server gets hacked, the, the attacker cannot expand, right? So it's a, it, it's, it's, a ver, it's a new security paradigm. It's very, very powerful. Total cost of ownership of a network that's based around NFV we find is about 30%, so 70% reduction off of a legacy network. That's really critical for an operator whose data is growing like crazy, but their ARPU isn't growing. We've spoken to a couple of carriers, and we've heard claims of 40% you know, to 80% reduction in OPEX by using SDN and NFV. To get this, there is an initial bump of expense which you have to incur. So if I take a very short-term business case, it's very hard to justify it. I think when, when the NFV concept first came around, uh, it was easy for the industry to say, oh, lower cost hardware. This is a CapEx issue. And then after that, they said, well, actually, maybe that's enough, not enough to make me really change my, my design and my intent. Maybe it's an OPEX issue. And then both of those still true, we finally graduated to this understanding that really this is about en enabling business agility but doing so at a much, much lower cost. I think of uh, NFV as the cloud value proposition for telcos. So they get the agility, they get the quick time to market. Uh, and what we saw in the cloud environment is that when you enable people to build something very quickly uh, in a very agile manner, instead of taking months and years of buying equipment and writing work orders and waiting for things to show up, that it enabled an amazing innovation revolution that created new markets and new revenue streams for everyone. This gives them the agility to create new revenue services that are unique to them rather than ones they have to share with everybody else because it comes in the same vendor product. The long-term view is they have to generate new revenue of their own creation. I think more than completely new services, it's about how do I offer existing types of services to new customers? How do I roll that out? How do I reach the small and medium business that before may have been too difficult? It enables the service providers to try out and, and introduce very rapidly new services. And if the service really is sticky and is adopted, then the service providers have the tools and the infrastructure that will elastically scale. If it fails, SDN NFV enables the service providers to fail, fail fast, and fail at a much lower cost point because they don't have to go and build out a new infrastructure to try out a new service. One example of a, of a use case that's really showing benefit already to, to the industry is something called a virtual CPE, or customer premise equipment. And that is taking uh, the network equipment that's on-premise uh, could be something as simple as your, your home uh, cable modem or ADSL router. We still need some hardware that's going to connect you to the network. Inside that hardware tends to be functionality like firewalling and routing. The um, question is, how do we manage that? And, and how do we introduce new services into that environment? How do you upgrade the infrastructure there? With the virtual CP now, I can put a piece of generic hardware out at the customer edge. And uh, as long as I've sort of 
uh, sized it so that it's a bit future-proof and in terms of capacity, I don't have to worry about its features or its functions because all of the features and functions come from the software which can be downloaded remotely onto it. You have a variety of ways you can provide services to that consumer uh, which it should improve their quality of service, new services available, services on demand. Open standards and in particular open source software is an unstoppable trend in, uh, in networking today. Our use of open source allowed us to um, probably develop a much more advanced product with about a 3x advantage in, in speed of development. I think what's really changed is how operators have embraced open source, um, and I think more the idea that they have, right? You know, if you would have gone back five years ago and said, look, we're gonna build a ton of the future teleco network on open source, people would have said you're crazy, right? Like they would not have believed that happening. As a enterprise or SMB, you're, you're leveraging a large community of expertise. You're sort of outsourcing some of your engineering to an external engineering group. Uh, in the context of NFV, we're building the NFV infrastructure out of these open source projects. For enterprise and SMB, in some cases, they'll be consumers of the technology. Critical way to improve your experience in consumption of new technologies is to be involved in the upstream projects and development of those of those technologies. The return is you know, you, you get to, to get out of it what you put in. Under normal circumstances, like in a world where bandwidth isn't exploding, the weight of these problems would be a non-starter for any new technology. But carrier networks are drowning in data, and you cannot buy enough dedicated hardware to keep up. This is an environment where NFV simply cannot be ignored. It must be done. I see SDN NFV trickling down from the early adopters who were either willing to take the risks or had so little legacy that they were able to do radically new things. Their success is going to enable people that are more risk averse or in more regulated or conservative environments to feel safe stepping across that line. And I think we're just going to see a sort of linear continuum of people who last year thought it was too dangerous and scary and experimental realizing that it's safe and mainstream and required in order to go you know, where their businesses are going to take them. I think the trend is unstoppable. What we see in the just even in the last six months is the rate of trials and things has just increased significantly because this has become part of the psyche of how operators are, are moving forward. These new platforms that are software based, in fact, way outperform the best of the legacy platforms. The reality is you're wasting money if you're not doing it. You know, if, if you really take one step back and, and ask from a, from a high level, what is happening here? I think fundamentally networking is turning to a software industry. This is the PC revolution all over again. The, the, the classically vertically integrated networking industry where you have the switch you know, with silicon software and, and, and the system all bought by one vendor is disaggregating. In the future, you'll buy the software that powers your network and the hardware that powers your network from different vendors. And I think it will lead to the similar Cambrian explosion of creativity that we saw in the server market when this happened will now happen in the networking market. So I think, I think this will be a golden age for networking. Stay tuned for part seven of the Network of the Future documentary series, The Internet of Things, Connecting It All. Coming soon to TIANow.org.